Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our online next gathering. Today's webinar is entitled How to Become Financially Nimble and Resilient, and is presented by Simon and Peter Magna of Iridium. Simon is a chartered accountant with a degree in business science. He is passionate about using tech to help businesses streamline processes, build efficiencies, and grow their profits. And Peter, one of the Psyca top 35, under 35, has a passion for people and technology and uses his skills and know-how to make businesses financially nimble and resilient. Simon and Peter are not your average accountants. If you're looking for a suit and tie, you've come to the wrong place. They believe in integrating technology with accounting practices to achieve the highest level of efficiency and are on a mission to help businesses boost their financial performance. Our webinar today will be made up of a talk by Simon and Peter for about 40 to 45 minutes, followed by Q&A. Throughout the session, we'll be running a live chat for you to post comments and questions, as well as live polls. We encourage everyone to get involved. Without further delay, over to Simon and Peter. Welcome everyone. Um, nice to uh, have you all here today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly so I can start the presentation. Um, and yeah, we're really looking forward to, uh, to talking through just some of the things that we've learned over the last uh, seven years of working with small businesses. Um, it's, it's been an interesting time and, um, and yeah, both Simon and I have, have learned different experiences, but uh, overall we've got some interesting stuff for you. So hopefully by now you can see our screen and um, uh, I'm Peter and um, uh, above is Simon. Uh, so just a little bit uh, more about us. Uh, we are brothers, um, Simon's my older brother and uh, it's about eight year, well, six years older. I've got a further older brother of uh, eight years older than me. And Simon started already in business um, seven and a half years ago. Uh, I joined shortly thereafter and um, currently my title is the sales and marketing director. Um, but for the most part, I, I delve in, do accounting, uh, do a little bit of sales, uh, do some marketing, and I kind of wear a lot of different hats. Um, we, we've got a team of 20 accountants and uh, people that uh, help uh, run our business. And we, uh, we've grown quite rapidly over the last few years. Uh, COVID's been particularly good for us. And uh, we've, we've taken on about 30 clients uh, during the course of COVID and had our best month ever in uh, July of this year. So um, that's just a little bit about us. Um, Simon's going to just touch base on uh, what we're going to cover today. Good afternoon, everyone. Like Peter said, thanks a lot for joining us. And thanks to Dennis uh, for inviting us to present. Um, we're hoping today is not going to be a normal accounting session, but I hope you're going to get some great value out of it. So the way we're going to run today is myself and Peter are going to kind of interchange between who's presenting. Um, the topics and kind of areas we're going to be covering today are let's tell you a story where we tell you a story about a client and a business that I think will be really relevant for you guys to hear from. Um, we can take a look at what happened in the past. We can learn from a bit of history um, and how things went. Uh, then we're going to move on to what are the traits of a nimble and resilient business? You know, that's kind of the title of our our, our webinar, uh, we really need to address those and make sure everyone's on the same page of what those mean. And what does that really mean from our financial perspective? Uh, have the right tools and what do those tools look like? Finding trusted partners to run your business, really, really key from our perspective. Uh, knowing your numbers, we can't be accountants without focusing on numbers. Um, and be ready for the next crisis. You know, is it gonna be COVID 2021 or 22, whatever that looks like. Let's be ready for the next one to happen. Then here's a question we'd like you guys to drop your answers in the, the chat area and, and share what your thoughts are. What would you like to get out of today? So it's one of those questions whenever you start up with something, we think it's really, really good to think about it and really make sure you've processed this. What do you want to get out of today? So please write those thoughts down. Uh, share them with us, uh, and hopefully during the course of the session, you are going to get it out. And um, 
if not during the session, we'll make sure we address that in the end in the Q&A and we'll make sure we give you a little bit more assistance around what that looks like. So that's the gist. Uh, Peter, I'm going to hand back to you to talk, tell us a story. Cool. Um, just, just before that, um, if the expectation is that this is going to be an hour long talk around SARS and uh, counting, uh, you've come to the wrong talk. Um, uh, so hopefully we can give you a slightly different perspective uh, on things and uh, give you some insights. So um, yeah, uh, let's let's take it take forward into um, just a, a one of our clients that uh, we really like and um, and their story. So what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to play the the video, um, but um, we are going to share the link on um, uh, to watch the video afterwards um, in in the chat. Um, we're going to get Simon to just uh, drop that in. Um, and basically, hopefully you guys uh, know who Phelps Gunnar. If you don't, uh, well, it's a, uh, it's a retail e-commerce wholesale business um, in South Africa. It's, it's quite new. It's, uh, it's in the last couple of years that they, uh, they started up and they've had rapid growth. Um, you know, COVID hit. Uh, they thought things were going to go well. Um, COVID hit and they, they had to relook at things. Um, obviously, you know, at the start of COVID, you, you couldn't uh, have an online business, you couldn't deliver retail, so their business came to a standstill. Um, they weren't able to uh, sell into their local uh, retailers like Woolworths, um, and uh, they had to rethink their strategy. So um, uh, they're quite uh, uh, strategic people, um, the three business owners, and they decided that... Um, uh, they wanted to see what they were able to do with the skills that they had and um, and uh, with the client base that they had built up or the community they had built up. Uh, and they quickly got to work. Um, they uh, pivoted uh, during COVID like uh, many people did, uh, but they also uh, took the uh, skills that they had and said, look, we can still sell shoes. We might not be able to deliver those shoes, uh, but we can still sell them. Uh, so they actually called every single one of their clients in their database um, using the people that they had um, because those people had extra time. And, um, and essentially, um, they, they had one of their best months in the month of April when um, COVID was at its, at its heights, um, uh, one of their best online months. Uh, and um, it, it was mainly because they had a, a really strong personal touch um, and, um, and they had great... Um, systems in place and um, and great partners. So um, I'm kind of just going to touch base on what are the key things that uh, we felt were important. Um, you, you might know if you can see the two people in the picture, the one on the left is Ashton Kutcher. Um, I'll give you uh, uh, an opportunity to think through who the person on the right is. And essentially um, why he's there is uh, Ashton was one of the sharks on Shark Tank uh, U US and um, uh, he actually invested in uh, Feltskin uh, US. Um, so they've branched out into multiple countries and one of their pivots was that they actually branched out into multiple countries during COVID. Um, uh, countries that were able to, to actually uh, service uh, retail. Um, they, one of the key things they had was great integrated systems. So they had an e-commerce system that plugged into inventory system that plugged into an accounting system and uh, a, a lot of other systems in place to make sure that they had great access to information. They had trusted partners. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, we were the only trusted partner. They had great partnerships with their stakeholders or shareholders, uh, with their banks, and, um, and actually with their clients. Uh, they knew their numbers, um, and that's, uh, that's quite vital um, for any small business understanding their numbers so that it could actually strategize to move forward. And, and finally, you know, they, they pivoted hard and added a personal touch. Um, their, their main pivot uh, during COVID to add extra revenue was uh, that they, you know, they knew digital, they knew how to run an e-commerce business. And so they used those skills of their, their team to actually advise to other e-commerce businesses. And, uh, um, let those businesses go digital. So they built up websites, did advertising campaigns, and uh, plugged in hard to, to actually get um, 
extra revenue and a dollar. So that's kind of um, their story. And, um, and just a quick recap, I'm going to delve into kind of just what we can learn from history. And um, there have been a number of crises over time. Um, more recently was the 2008 crisis, which I think uh, uh, everyone can remember. Um, we had the 2000 dot com bubble, and uh, you know the 1929 was a big one. And um, I think it's important to look back on those and see what we could learn. But uh, for us, to be honest, the 2008 is probably the most important one. Uh, I think it's where you know the internet was around. Uh, where uh, e-commerce was around, where digital marketing were, was was at, at play, you know, social media was around. So uh, there were similar characteristics and similar things that we could utilize um, between 2008 and now. Uh, dot com, uh, it, th there's some lessons, but for the most part, um, I think 2008 was, was much more important. So in terms of that, um, what uh, what's important to look at is you know what happened um, and uh, what did uh, what was the response between um, you know different companies and uh, I think uh, the little picture that I have over here is just one of of what happens typically in a um, in a crash or in general um, in the economy and um, like like you know there's peaks and troughs and um, the, the critical thing between the peaks and troughs are how quickly one gets out of a trough and uh, moves into peaking and prospering. And um, that, that's what we found that between the 2008 and now, uh, when looking back on the, a number of companies, um, the more resilient companies were the ones that not necessarily you know, lost less, um, because you can see in the graph, uh, all the companies in in that uh, early stage, they all kind of lost a similar amount uh, in terms of, of of overall growth, and a lot of them lost similar amounts of revenue. But it's actually their bounce back ability, the ability to get out of uh, the the crisis, get out of the recession, and bounce back quicker. And that's that blue line, the resilient companies, um, and those are in comparison to the S and P five hundred which is you know, a good metric of, of the average top 500 companies uh, in, in the US. And I think that's one of the critical things is always understanding what were the characteristics or traits of those companies that were more resilient and what can we learn from them? And um, also noting that you know, 2008 to two, uh, 2020, there are some differences. Once again, there's, there's newer things that have happened um, new technology that's come out between 2008 and 2020. So I think it is important to um, take, you know, take a look at what they, they did uh, at the resilient companies, see what we can glean from them, but also um, add on top of that and say, you know, what are current companies doing that are, are seemingly bouncing back quicker um, from, from the general market? Um, and uh, often it's really hard to, to look at that and go, well, where do I even start? What information can I look at to, to understand? Um, is it you know, just the guys in the media? Um, what tools can I utilize to, to glean more information? And, um, and that's, that's essentially why we're here. Um, we're here to just unpack a few things uh, based on our experience with, uh, with SMEs and with businesses in the market and just what we read out in the market. So I'm just gonna move on. And um, uh, we've got a quick poll um, that is gonna pop up on your screen, um, just to understand a little bit uh, more about you know, how COVID-19 has impacted your business. And um, yeah, uh, I'd, I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to understand just, just where it's at. Uh, we won't give you too much time, um, but, uh, but yeah, please answer that. Then uh, it can lead our conversation a bit better. But essentially, um, what the screen is is uh, in every recession, there's there's different shapes of a recession. Um, the the V shape is the ideal shape. Um, it's the the recession that bounces back nice and quickly. 
Um, great. So let me just pause there and say, um, it looks like overall, uh, more than half of us uh, feel like that uh, we're getting past it. Um, but uh, you know, there there are actually well, there's 58 percent uh, of the group that said um, that they it was tough, but they're getting there. Uh, three that uh, or 25 percent that said that they're really struggling, and there've been a couple that well, not really that actually had benefited or had no impact. Uh, so that's quite interesting. Um, I think uh, for us, we'll kind of dive into, well, uh, where we're at. But for the most part, I think what's interesting to understand in, in, in this is, you know, what shape are we uh, as an economy, but also what shape are you as a business? Are, are you bouncing back really quickly? Um, or are you finding on the far right-hand side that it's taking a lot longer to get back to where you needed to be? One of the tools that uh, uh, we found really helpful is uh, a tool by Yoko, uh, one of the card payment providers. And uh, they've essentially built out a small business recovery monitor. It takes their 20, sorry, their, their 80,000 customer base and tracks the sales uh, on a daily basis uh, across the entire country. Uh, so if you're looking for some interesting insights that are literally on a daily basis, how a small business is doing, um, they've got a range of businesses uh, both small, big e-commerce, retail, hospitality, quite a range of uh, industries. Uh, so it's actually a great indicator of, of where we're at. You know, when um, COVID hit, we started off and it was around 5 to 6% of normal trading was their initial indicator. Uh, currently, they're sitting at about 86% uh, of, of normal trading. And uh, that differs across uh, you know, provinces, I think it's a great tool to use to just give you insights as to where, where the market's at. Um, there, there's not really much else out there that can give you up-to-date insights. In terms of, um, you know, how we're doing, um, uh, I'm going to pass on to Simon and just give a quick insight of, um, you know, where, where our journey's been and how we've, uh, uh, how we've been impacted by, uh, by COVID. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, so I, I think uh, it, it's a really interesting, um, you know, concept to look at these shapes of the curve. Uh, and uh, if I look at the past few months, we definitely had a, a sharp decline, um, you know, when COVID hit uh, sort of a month afterwards. Uh, and I think the U-shaped curve is probably the one that probably reflects the, our business, how it's been. Well, we had a, a big decline in, in revenue. Uh, business definitely dropped off for a few months. And there were significant cost-cutting methods we had to implement. Um, and what we found is as soon as we got into that level two, level one stage, people got out of that kind of panic mode of not wanting to make any decisions. And they started being willing to make decisions and willing to commit to ways forward. And uh, I think they had the time and the perspective to actually look at the right way to manage their finances. Uh, and, and we found a massive uptick in terms of new clients coming our way uh, and as a matter of fact, July 2020 was the largest single month in our business's history in terms of new clients taken on, uh, you know, which, which I think was partially due to us being ready for that kind of environment. But I think also due to the, the marketing that, you know, Peter and our marketing team executed over the first six months of the year, you know, where you push a lot of marketing out there and you don't necessarily get that response. And then suddenly when the kind of uh, climate is right for it, people respond to what you're putting out there. So you know, that, that's kind of my take. I don't know if you're on the same page as that, Pete. Yeah, I think it's, um, it is tricky when you're in the kind of trenches in that, uh, that VURL to kind of see it light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but it, it really does come down to um, kind of looking at, a, uh, looking at your business, um, uh, looking at the uh, you know, the, the drivers of your business, whether or not they are still relevant and uh, finding, finding ways to kind of be a lot more agile and nimble in this, uh, this time. So uh, for us, uh, you know, I, I researched a lot around what, uh, what other businesses uh, historically had done uh, to get out of recessions. And one of the things that really stuck was that they, uh, they really marketed their businesses well 
and provided value in the marketing, not just uh, hard selling. And, and so one of the things that we uh, uh, we utilized was, you know, we, we called our clients, we added that personal touch. Uh, we, we try to add value where we could, even though we weren't necessarily getting revenue from that. Uh, so things like uh, helping them with their loan applications um, during COVID so that they could get funding meant that they were able to get additional cash flow, which meant that they bounced back quicker. And they recommended us to, to you know, friends and other businesses, which meant that we got money in uh, at a later stage. So sometimes it's about thinking about the long term, thinking out creatively around what you can do and not necessarily how much money you can spend, but what you can do to kind of uh, do things differently than what the current market is doing. Uh, so yeah, I think it's an interesting time still. I think there's a lot that one can still do now that can put you ahead of your competitors and just uh, put you on the right stead. Uh, so yeah, let me just uh, dive into what, what we think you could have learned uh, or should learn from the 2008 crisis. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just going to pass it on to Simon. Yeah, thanks, Peter. So I think one of the really interesting things that I found out of the research in this was that was it better products or services that made the difference? And the, the answer we got back was no, it wasn't. So it wasn't a better product or a better service, which is often what people think is a differentiator. Uh, it wasn't that. Um, things that made the biggest impact was how quickly did you reduce your operational expenses to initiate? And what did you reduce in your operational expenditure? Um, you know, when you look at, should I just cut salaries? You know, often in a, in a lot of companies, that's the largest expenditure. Um, you know, there's a huge potential for backlash. You know, if you retrench a whole lot of people or cut salaries across a whole lot of employees, um, those employees are not going to be feeling great about life. And when your business kind of gets back into good space, if you've retrenched those people, they're not available now to actually help you grow your business and move forward. Um, so, so that's a really interesting thing to kind of think about. Um, one of the things that is really important for all of these people who did well was they maintained loyalty. So they made sure they communicated with their clients, like Peter mentioned. They made sure that they engaged with them, and offered them discounts to hold those clients on. You know, so during uh, COVID in South Africa, you, you couldn't sell things to people because you couldn't, sorry, you couldn't deliver things to people. You could still sell. So a lot of e-commerce websites sold either vouchers or products for delivery as soon as lockdown was ended or as soon as couriers could start delivering. So they didn't hold back on selling. They kept pushing on sales. They kept offering discounts to incentivize people to make those purchases. And that's what these 2008 crash survivors did really well. Um, and then digital marketing, what is your strategy? How do you do it? Being very clear and executing and it was really critical across the board. So that, those are kind of the key things we picked up there. Um, let's jump back into, uh, you know, a little bit more on the role of marketing and Pete, that's being your area of expertise. You can just talk to this. Yeah, sure. So it sounds kind of weird hearing uh, accountants talk about marketing and, um, and, and that, uh, that's probably you know, because we, we're not trying to just say, uh, you know, cut all your costs, but we also try to say, be strategic in what you're cutting, when you're cutting it and when you're spending. And uh, one of the key things that marketing allows you to do is it allows you to reduce that depth of that downturn and also speed up the, um, the actual uptick. So, you know, moving away from that L shape and closer to that V shape. Um, I, I did a quick kind of search around just to gather some insights around um, what are things you can actually do uh, during a downturn and uh, uh, on the uptick. Uh, and I think, interestingly, I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, uh, kind of the general threads are, you know, have a have a have have data, um, have a process in place around using that data, um, make sure that you're uh, utilizing content marketing, not just uh, AdWords. You know, AdWords are great; uh, we love AdWords, but it's also during this time people got flooded with advertising that's not necessarily valuable to them. So things like mailers, um, you know, webinars were all great, um, but uh, people's email boxes got flooded. 
So you've got to be creative with how you, how you do things, what value you're providing, and understand your customer base. And then in order to actually drive your business out of the uh, downturn quicker, uh, you need to be spending more. And one of the key things that we've learned is we've actually, uh, during lockdown, spent more money on marketing than we ever have in the past. And funny enough, as Simon was saying, you know, we might have spent more, um, but we've actually had one of the most successful um, last few months in the history of our business because we were not just spending money arbitrarily, we we're wise in our spending. Uh, we're making sure that we're adding value to our clients and um, we're thinking about our marketing. And uh, yes, we are using AdWords. Uh, we, we're currently spending a fair, fair amount, about 10,000 Rand a month, um, just driving traffic to our business, but also um, making sure that we're, we're wise in, in you know, what, what our website looks like. So there's a lot of great insights that OnlineX have uh, on their resources. Um, I, I'd, I'd highly recommend taking a look at them. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's just uh, we we did also have a poll um, around this. I'm going to get um, the team just to pop it up, um, and um, whilst we're popping that up, I'm just going to move on to the next slide. Thanks, Fred. I'll step in here. Yeah? If you wouldn't mind just answering the question, and uh, we'll tell you the the answers uh, uh, shortly. Cool. Thanks, Pete. So I, I think just a, a few things to point out, you know, that we felt are, are key traits of nimble and resilient, uh, of, of a nimble and resilient business uh, that we found is uh, being agile and adaptable. So agility talks to that ability to move in, in kind of the, in, in, a, in an uncomplicated manner that's not held back. Um, you know, that's often one of the key characteristics of small businesses. And, you know, the word agile is often used in an IT environment, talking to that ability to shift and, and move as the requirements come up. Um, so I think that's really uh, interesting. And, and the adaptability, you know, someone, uh, you know, this morning was telling me one of the clients they engaged with uh, was an online men's and women's uh, swimwear company. You know, so very kind of e-commerce driven, uh, all about the brand. They, they hit lockdown and they realized they weren't able to sell their swimwear and no one was going to the beach anyway, so they couldn't sell it. And what they did is they did a very quick pivot and they were adaptable and they suddenly became an online fresh fruit and produce company. And they were delivering food in the same way that, that, that someone might have been selling it through a fruit and veg company in the past, they became that company. So huge shift in the product uh, and what they found is they grew an audience they would have never had before. Uh, and very quickly, as soon as the deliveries allowed on those shorts, they'd opened up a whole new client base who now were interested in their products and thought it was quite cool to order your fruit and veg from a company that also happened to deliver you a pair of swimming trunks, which also looked quite cool because they had, you know, funky pictures on. So really interesting how they did. Brand builders, you know, people, people naturally flock to a brand. Uh, and it's because we trust the brand and we don't want to make mistakes when we make our purchasing decisions. So when you can build a brand, uh, that really makes it so much easier for people to make that decision and make it a decision that makes them feel comfortable. And that's what people are always looking to do, which is why, like we've mentioned a few times, building an online brand is really fundamental. Um, grittiness, grit is a word that is kind of really interesting, you know, and, and I know Peter has read uh, a book on grit recently, and, and grit talks to that ability to get through challenging situations when they come up and find a way through. Kind of, it's that determination uh, that you keep working towards a goal when you know what you're working on. Great communicators, internal and external, um, chatting to your team and chatting to your consumers on a regular and consistent basis is really fundamental. Everyone needs to know what's going on. Having a kick-ass culture, you know, we really love kind of building culture and, and, and teams love having a great culture. And it goes beyond a whole lot of uh, you know, other challenges you face. Vision and values. If you don't know what you're building towards and you know what your values are, how do you make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis against what metrics or what kind of lineup? Um, and then the last thing that we really love is you know, having a team of rock stars. You know, hiring, training, rewarding, 
and, and uh, offboarding people who don't quite line up with that. So that's all around your team. So, you know, I, I think those are really great points to kind of dwell on and think about. And, and you know, I think it'd be good for you guys to think about those in the context of your business. Um, so uh, I, I think that's kind of all we're going to dwell on there. Tools. Everyone loves to know what tools. And I've seen a few questions already in the chat kind of section are asking around tools and what, what, you know, what's the right answer. You know, from an accounting point of view, we love working with Xero. We, we think it's probably one of the easiest uh, you know, cloud-based accounting system that's out there. It's exceptionally easy to work with from an accountant's point of view and from a business owner's point of view. Every client we've set up on Xero has communicated that it, it makes them feel in control. It's simple, it's visible. You can uh, integrate with hundreds of other programs. There's an open API. So any e-commerce platform can integrate with it. It can share data between it. Really, really helpful. So I think one of you guys were asking for a question. I think uh, Keshna was asking about, I, I use Wave, but it's not quite where I need to be. You know, Xero is a great tool. It's about $30 a month to use. Uh, and I think for a small business, it's a great answer and it does everything you need, you know, right down to your batch reports, management accounts and everything else. Um, we, we like working with Simple Pay, which is an online payroll program. Again, integrates with zero, really easy to use, very low cost of kind of use. I think we're talking 10 rand per month per employee. Um, and another program that we love working with is called Receipt Bank. Uh, and Receipt Bank is a program that's got OCR technology, which basically means you take a photograph on your cell phone or you forward an invoice you know, into the back end, it scans the invoice, pulls out all the relevant data and allows you to push that directly into your accounting system uh, for speed of use. There's no need for a box of paperwork. Everything is digitized immediately. So it's a great solution. Um, integrated inventory management. You know, as soon as you are selling products on a regular basis, you need to know how much stock you've got on hand. And every time you sell a product, you need to know what was the cost involved in that product. And when you bring in things from overseas, you need to know what is the landed cost of that product. What is the Forex com converted? What are the delivery costs of getting it here? And using a proper inventory management solution is the right way to do that. And that system often talks to your e-commerce uh, platform as well. Trusted partners, we spoke earlier. You need to have people you can rely on when things are difficult. You know, having financial partners you can trust on, suppliers that are supporting you and able to help you, and having business partners that you can work with make this entire process so much easier to manage and, and really is kind of the key we feel in making this work for you. Uh, just handing back to Peter, uh, who's gonna just touch on a uh, e-commerce business and systems we think are an uh, interesting fit. Yeah, so just um, uh, our general philosophy around, um, uh, around tech is uh, it needs to speed up your processes and make life easier. So this is an example of one of our clients. Uh, you can see all the lines point to almost the data flowing between systems. And we love uh, you know, speeding things up. So Receipt Bank allows you to capture data and uh, from an expense management perspective and push it into an accounting system like Xero. Simple Pay pushes the payroll in. Uh, Deer manages inventory. Um, and that allows you to have real-time inventory pushing up into your Shopify store. Uh, you know, you can replace Shopify with WooCommerce because Deer also does integrate there. And then you need a, a, a career company and a payment gateway or two. Uh, and all of those systems, uh, in our opinion, need to talk together to create one overall ecosystem. So whenever you're looking at your, um, your overall uh, text stack, or tech, um, uh, tech solution, uh, you need to understand how they connect together, whether or not they connect together. Um, if you unplug any one of those lines, uh, you're going to need somebody to do work in that space. So if I unplug the um, DIA system, uh, well, I don't have inventory being managed automatically or sales flowing man uh, directly through to zero. So I need to find other uh, solutions that uh, normally means people. Uh, so having a good tech stack means you're able to do things faster, better, and provide a better overall experience for your customers. Great. 
Cool. Uh, let me excuse. jump into... Thanks, Peter. Um, so knowing your numbers, like we said at the start, we're accountants, you've got to talk to the numbers. Um, but, but, but it's interesting kind of what that means from a business owner's point of view. So I, I think our key things we want you to think about is you need to take accountability for understanding your numbers and you need to hold your finance partner responsible. So th th those are two really interesting uh, yeah, kind of concepts. Uh, let, let's pop up the poll uh, and then I'm gonna explain those in a little bit more detail. Um, so do you utilize an accounting package? No, we don't. We have one, but only my accountant has access. We have one and I use it regularly. I'd like to start using one. So really simple questions. If you guys can just pop in your answers there. Um, and, and then as soon as we get all that on, all those answers back, we'll just address that. So thinking about the accountability and holding your finance partner responsible. Um, I, I think this, these words accountable and responsible are things that we've grappled with before in our business. Uh, and, and I think the key thing to take away here is if you own the company, if something is not done, you need to own that. You're going to be ultimately held accountable. So if you don't pay your VAT return, you're going to be held accountable. Uh, if, if you have an a outsourced accountant or an in-house accountant and they forget to load up your VAT return, as much as they're responsible for doing the work, Ultimately, you're the one who's going to take the hit when it doesn't get paid and you get a fine. So I think the key thing we're saying is understand your numbers and make sure that the buck stops with you and you know how to hold your partners accountable and you don't absolve yourself of responsibility because that's not taking accountability. So that's the, the first point we want to make. The second thing is review your numbers every month. And that's your income statement and your balance sheet, not just your income statement. Okay, and you need to understand the differences between what the numbers are and what you expected them to be. Because that's a really key thing, because when you look at numbers in isolation, it's hard to make a call on the reasonability of them. But when you compare a number and say, I expected sales to be half a million and they ended up being 300,000, that's a big difference from expectation. You need to explain it. You know, whereas if your rental cost, you expected it to be 10,000 and it was 10,000, Let's not talk about that. That's not something you need to think about, okay? You also need to build out solid reporting metrics. So what do you measure? How do you know what's good in your business? If you're a manufacturing company or you're selling products, you know, having a, a good indication of what the right GP for your business is, is super critical. And I saw a question that popped up earlier from Paula. She was saying, what margin should a product-based business be adding to a cost of a product? manufactured locally, uh, and, and her understanding was 150% to make a, a, the right margin. Um, again, th th that's an interesting question. And, and often in these kind of environments, it's, it's difficult to know the right answer. And it's difficult to know the right answer because your, your price and what you should mark it up by is often determined by what the consumer is willing to pay for something, you know, and, and what the right margin is. And, and that's gonna make a huge impact on what the overall final point is. Um, another thing, make SARS your friend. Um, you, you really need to make sure that you understand all your tax liabilities and when they are coming up. And I'd really recommend every business owner has a piece of paper or, or something on their computer that they can go and visit whenever they want to and know these are my taxes, this is when they're coming up and what's going on. And the last thing that everyone seems to not enjoy, and, and that's why we're not going to dwell on it, but you need to plan ahead. You need to budget. You know, if you, if you don't budget, I promise you, you're never going to get to any goal that you intended to. It just doesn't work like that. Uh, let's jump into the next section, Peter, around uh, some costs. And I think there'll be a couple of relevant points for you guys to think about. So cost management was the, one of the fundamental things that we did during lockdown uh, and in terms of managing things. And really, really important to get this right. A lot of people are, are concerned about this and that they don't want to deal with cost management because it seems a negative thing. You know, we're not asking you to cut all your costs. We're asking you to understand in, in, a, in a way that makes sense to you. In accounting, you can, you can name things whatever you want to. If you want to call the rent that you pay every month your HQ cost, and that makes sense to you, tell your accountant that's what you want to call it. So don't let your accountant or your finance department tell you what things need to be called. You can call them anything you want, and you can group them in any way you want to, as long as it makes sense to you 
and you can measure that against kind of expectations. So major costs that you always need to understand and be able to kind of talk off your fingertips on, rental, employee costs, loan repayments on car, equipment, mortgage, super critical. Those are your big numbers. And your director or member salaries, you really need to know those very well. And those are big things that you can't always shift in the short term, but they can have a bigger impact in the longer run. And then other operating costs that we're talking about are marketing, advertising, a lot more flexibility. But like we said earlier, should you be cutting those because it could have a long-term impact. Repairs and maintenance, I can assure you that no repairs and maintenance were going on for most companies during this type of time. Everyone was just going, it'll keep working. I'll just patch it up. Um, consultants struggled. Some consultants did very well. You know, so e-commerce website construction was flying, but other people who were consulting about things that weren't deemed relevant dropped off. Software costs, we reached out to every software vendor we had and asked them, can you give me a discount for a few months to help me through? And a lot of SaaS companies helped out. Insurance did a similar thing. Bank fees are kind of what they are. Very hard to change. Um, let, let's jump onto the last slide, Peter. And we've already dealt in it a little bit around costs. Um, but, but in terms of a, a SaaS perspective, know your taxes. There is that. There's POIE, SDL, UIF, and ETI. Very relevant. Ask those questions. There's a quick poll. Are you tax compliant? Yes, no, I don't know something you should really, really know. And it's a really good indicator of uh, where people are at in terms of their process. Uh, so the other things just to mention around SARS, so corporate and prod tax, PYE, SDL, UIF, and ETI, and VAT. I think those are great things to actually have on a list, know when they're coming up, know what the timing of this, and know how to make sure you're on top of what you're doing. And if you're on top of all of those, you should be tax compliant. So that's a really kind of uh, good thing to know. Um, I'll wait for those poll results to come in and I'm just gonna jump into the last two things. So Department of Labor, if you registered with SARS, you also need to register with the Department of Labor. And if you had registered with the Department of Labor during lockdown, you'd have been able to apply for TERS, which was great funding. So that, that's really good to see. So you know, all the people who answered were all tax compliant. And I really encourage you to keep being tax compliant because often that's a prerequisite for dealing with certain suppliers or customers, you need to have a tax compliance certificate. So Department of Labor, quick one again, UIF and Workman's Comp or COIDA, you have to register every company for that. It's not just people who work in the construction industry, like a lot of people think, or in dangerous sectors. Everyone has to do it. Based on your industry type, you get, you get charged a fee that's slightly different. And UIF, you're paying already through SARS, but you can't get all the benefits if you're not registered properly with the Department of Labor. So it's an admin thing and a once and, and making sure that's set up, you've got a number, you can then benefit. And then once a year, you need to pay CRPC an annual return fee. It can be something as simple as 100 Rand for a small business. So not big numbers, but if you don't pay it, they start deregistering your business. Something you definitely want to avoid. And it's something that uh, we've seen a number of people look really poor at because they go along and they present their company to someone and the first thing we go and do is pull a compliance check online and realize they haven't done an annual return in five years. It doesn't look like a good company to invest in if they haven't done your annual return in a long time, they're not aware of it, and potentially they're not even tax compliant. So there's little things I think you just want to be aware of, not a complicated thing to do, and make sure you get them out the way. So I, I think that's all from, from my side on the SARS point of view. Um, Peter, you want to jump into the next one? But basically, um, these are things that we think are really vital uh, to kind of look at for the next crisis or just, you know, right now and uh, leading up to that uh, uh, potential next crisis. And uh, it's building a loyal community uh, that that means, you know, not just uh, customers, but uh, your team and uh, your suppliers. So building a network around you. Uh, that are loyal to your brand, uh, uh, your values, your vision, um, and um, and that's something you can start now and, and build over time. It does take a lot of time, and so you you need to be very aware of how to build one, and um, and that it's not going to just happen overnight. Um, as Simon said, you need to own your numbers. You need to be accountable for them. You need to know what's important in your business. What are the key metrics? that will drive your business forward. Things like your GP that we had as a question, 
it's it is a really valuable uh, um, thing to know. Um, it's something that changes over time, but uh, it's important to to know what your responsibility is and make sure that you're owning your numbers. Um, in order to do all that, you need to have good systems. So we're not saying, you know, zero is the best thing since sliced bread. It's something that we feel is important. And we, we as a business have, have, uh, have, have used for all of our clients. But, you know, there are a lot of great systems out there. So it's important to just make sure that you're stepping back, looking at your tech stack, as I mentioned, and making sure that things are flowing seamlessly, uh, that you're not spending too much time uh, trying to piece together pieces of data because you should actually be spending that time building your business. Uh, have good partners, you know, have a great financial partner. Make sure you build great relationships with your suppliers and, um, and make sure that uh, you know, you've got great relationship with your bank and other key stakeholders within your business. Those are the guys that are gonna help you drive your business forward. So make sure you're building good relationships. And lastly, stay agile. Um, I think, you know, times are changing quickly. Um, new technology is coming in. Uh, there's lots to learn. Uh, it's important to make sure that you're, you're not sitting back, being complacent, and thinking that you got things covered. Because, you know, 2021, 2022, another crisis might hit. You need to have the tools, the mindsets, and the information to, 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 to really drive your business forward. And um, you know, reading lots of books around uh, you know, how other people have done it sounds cliched, but it really does work. So um, yeah, stay agile. And um, from, from us, we'd love to just open up the next uh, 10 minutes to some questions. I know there's already been a number of people that uh, have uh, ask questions. I think we're going to start off by running through those, but please uh, ask away. Uh, as we said, this is not a, a full-blown uh, budget and forecasting session. Um, this is more of a business session. So we open to uh, any questions around running a better business, technology, and uh, yeah, just anything. Uh, so uh, Simon, why don't you kick off with um, Michelle's question? Um, well, actually, sorry, um, we had Paula um, who was talking about uh, the fact that she's selling a premium product. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, I, I know uh, Paula also kind of then went on to ask around the GP and what should she do. Um, so selling a premium product where people don't have the disposable income, that's a really interesting thing. Because if, if I asked you, would you think that uh, a pair of felt skins are an essential product? You're probably going to tell me, no, it's not an essential product. But, but the interesting thing that I found is that when I got out of like hard lockdown and, and shops opened up, the first thing I wanted to do was buy Lego online for my kids because it made them excited that there was uh, something new. So I, I felt that like lockdown where I didn't have uh, the ability to do anything, the first thing I wanted to do was go and spend money and buy something. And, and we, we understand that we're, we're in a recession right now from a national point of view. But not everyone's in a recession. There are a number of people who have a lot of disposable income and are wanting to spend that disposable income. So if you're selling a premium product, I can't imagine the basic uh, person earning less than 10,000 Rand a month is ever going to be your clientele. You should be targeting people who've got lots of money. Um, I, I went riding my bike, like the picture in the background of my uh, you know, window says, uh, riding my bike in Takai the other day in the forest. And there were people riding past me on 200,000 Rand mountain bikes that just bought the previous weekend. So it definitely shows that some people have money, some people have no money. And if you're going in the premium space, uh, I don't think you need to be shy of charging what you think if people rely on that. Uh, and I know a lot of people enjoy buying online. So Paula, my answer would be, if you're having a premium product, sell it at the price point that you think the brand needs to be at and sell that value of why people should be buying the product and I think people will definitely respond to that. Yeah, I mean, just to, to add to that, Paula, um, I think it's also about understanding who you're selling to, uh, understanding what markets you're potentially able to sell into. Uh, so, you know, a number of our clients uh, uh, during COVID, the likes of a, you know, Feltskin, also Rowdy Bags, which is a premium leather bag manufacturer in Cape Town. 
um, they started selling into overseas markets and they've done incredibly well overseas because it's a great product overseas, it's cheap. Similarly to Feltzkin, they branched out into, I think between five and 10 additional markets um, during COVID where it was, they were able to get their products there and the price point is actually much cheaper for the, that market. So it's not necessarily that you just have to focus on local. Um, E-commerce and, uh, and courier companies allow you to branch out. So see what you can do and potentially maybe have, a, have some products that, that uh, cater for a slightly lower, lower price point. But um, yeah, be sure that you, you know who, you, who you're targeting. Um, in terms I think, of, Peter, that, that, probably answers, that probably answers the next question as well, Peter, in terms of Paula's question around GP. Uh, and I think with uh, Keshni's question around uh, software, I think like we said earlier, Zero is a great tool. Um, you know, I think you need to look at your business costs and what's important. And I think investing, once your business has got going, investing in a good quality uh, reporting tool that allows you to have visibility at all times of your business is critical. So I wouldn't go and skimp on it and go along and use a spreadsheet. If your business has got going, put something in place. If you're not ready to get something in place, wait until your business gets to the point that it is and then go ahead and make that acquisition. Perfect. And just another question around the Department of Labor. Maybe we weren't super clear, but you only need to register for the Department of Labor when you register for payroll taxes. So if you, if you don't have any, anyone on payroll, um, including yourself, um, you're included in that. So when Simon started out and he was the only employee, he still needs to register for the Department of Labor um, and for, for workman's compensation. Uh, so if you don't have any people, you don't need to. Um, if you are paying people and you've got full-time employees, unfortunately you do need to be registered with the Department of Labor. Um, uh, one other great point that um, Paula brought up was that Yoko, um, once again, we're big fans of Yoko. We actually do some work for them. Um, that uh, Yoko uh, recently brought out a, a payment gateway, um, like a pay fast type approach. And um, currently they, they utilize it for, uh, for only WooCommerce websites. Um, they're testing it uh, currently and they're gonna branch out into Shopify. I think uh, what uh, Paula highlights is that technology is rapidly changing. There's new things coming into the market all the time. So the stuff that you have right now isn't necessarily the best solution in two months time. So make sure that you're constantly reevaluating uh, your tech stack uh, over time so that you're able to get the most value and the best price out of things. Um, uh, are, are there any other questions? Um, I, I can't see anything in the, uh, the chat, but um, maybe I've missed uh, one or two. Um, from a network research aspect, how would you recommend someone go about finding the right people to work with? And how would someone go about selecting the right tools for your business? Um, that's a great, uh, great question. Thanks, Josh. Um, so uh, Simon, do you wanna maybe uh, answer that? Sure. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So I think one of the things I found in any business is when you start out and you're not sure about things, surround yourself with people who are great at what they're doing. You know, if you're in the e-commerce space, there are a number of people out there who really are great at what they do and they can teach you all the basics very quickly. Um, and and uh, the, the, the thing that I, I find really interesting is those people don't even want to charge you. They've got free resources out there. If you engage with lots of people and build a community, it's there. So I, I really recommend people engage with people. When we started our business, we went to every single business talk event and we just talked to people um, and we engaged with people. And what we found really interesting is from that, those people wanted to uh, engage further. So that, that's the right way to do it. Just get, be passionate about it, get stuck into it. Um, and, and how do you find the right people? Just keep talking, asking everyone. Uh, if you ask me what tools we use in our business, I'm happy to share that. Uh, and I think in the past, people need to be scared. I'm not gonna tell you what I do, because then you're gonna copy me. People seem very open these days to actually share thoughts around what tools they work with. So when another accountant phones me up and says, what tools do you use? 
I say, I love, I love Xero. I love Receipt Bank. I use Simple Pay. Uh, I use uh, this document management system in-house. I use Google G Suite. Um, and this is my internal planning system. Uh, I've thought about this. I've thought about that. So those are all the kind of the thought processes, you know, that people follow as they're thinking this all through. So I, I think keep talking to me, keep plugging away. Um, I love Twitter and LinkedIn. I think people share amazing information there. And, and as you build out your community of people you follow, those people love sharing thoughts and answers. So keep engaging, keep talking. And, and I think you'll find a lot of things to uh, kind of help you. So I, I, that's probably all we have time for today, Peter. I think that's, uh, uh, th that's been a good session from my point of view. And I know Paula got some value out of it. Um, I'm hoping more people get value out of this as they think it through and it, uh, and like anything, I encourage you to listen to things and have one or two things that spark from that. And that's what I always try and take out of a session. What is my next step? So I will all encourage you to go away from today and think, what do I need to change? What's that one thing I need to do that's going to help my business move forward and, and take it from there?